Hello, welcome to my UCP Cerebral Palsy Talk. Today we are going to have our guest speaker, Sarah Marshall, who's a certified swallowing specialist that works at UFM Hospital. This is probably one of my favorite sessions that I'm looking forward to because I have swallowing issues all the time. <laughs> and there's always ways that we can learn from one another and learn from Sarah about safe ways of uh, eating our food, swallowing our food. I know I'm going to start Sarah by giving you one of my tricks or one of my things that I do is that I find that combination helps me better than water when I'm having trouble and if I have something stuck, I am doing this kind of my number one go-to. Just take it away. I love that. I often tell people to try to swallow their pills with carbonated liquid because the pill will float in the bubbles oh, and okay. it slides right down. So we can talk about um, issues with pills a little bit later on. Um, but yeah, carbonation gives you a little bit of extra, extra sensory input because the bubbles and the carbonation can help you swallow a little bit faster. We do have research that shows when you swallow something carbonated, you tend to swallow it a little bit faster than something like room temperature water because the bubbles just give your throat a little bit of an extra feeling and you can feel the bubbles going through. If something's stuck along the way, especially stuck in your esophagus, the bubbles might help to expand things and help push that food down. So that's very interesting that you've figured out that that works for you. Not everybody has the same tricks and strategies, but um, I love to learn from my patients to see what kind of things are helpful for them um, with their swallowing. Um, I want to thank you very much for inviting me to talk today, and I'm I'm hopeful that this is really beneficial and you all learn a lot, and I'm just more than happy to spend some time at the end answering any questions that you might have. So let's get started. Um, as Paul said, I'm a speech pathologist. I work at Michigan Medicine, and I have specialty board certification in swallowing and swallowing disorders. I have been here at Michigan Medicine for um, almost 10 years and practicing for 22. We're going to move forward. Hopefully this is working before. So today we're going to go through uh, swallowing mechanics and anatomy and what our swallowing evaluations look like. I'm going to introduce the EDACS, which is an eating and drinking ability classification system developed in the UK for people with cerebral palsy. We'll talk about some mealtime experiences, recent research, aging with cerebral palsy and the issues that can crop up with swallowing. And then we'll finish up talking about some treatments that are available. Swallowing is a really complicated process. It's not just putting food or liquid in your mouth and having the reflex to swallow and the food and liquid slides right down. 
swallowing's broken up into three different stages. We talk about the oral stage or what happens in your mouth. The pharyngeal stage is your throat part of the swallow. And then the esophageal stage is your food tube. What happens between your throat and your stomach? All three of these stages can be impacted in, in different severities for different people, depending on what your underlying medical condition is. As a speech pathologist, our specialty really is focusing on what's going on in the mouth and the throat. If there's a problem with the esophagus, we may be able to see that there is food getting stuck. In general, a GI doctor, a gastroenterologist really is the specialist of the esophagus. So we're going to spend most of this talk talking about um, what's happening in the mouth and the throat with the swallowing. Here's a picture of the anatomy of the throat. I want you to focus on the left side of this graphic down in the throat area. In the front, you can see where the airway is, the larynx is your voice box, the vocal cords are here at the very top of your upper airway, and right behind where the voice box is, is the opening to the esophagus. When you swallow, there are actually 26 pairs of muscles and five different pairs of cranial nerves. So nerves coming out of your brainstem that help you control the muscles of speech and swallowing. All of those have to work fairly perfectly in order for food and liquid to be controlled in the mouth and not spill straight down into the airway on its way down into the esophagus there is less than one centimeter of space between the open airway and the upper esophagus. And so there's very little room for error. Dysphagia is the medical term for difficulty swallowing. So trouble swallowing food through your mouth and your throat is called oropharyngeal dysphagia. And this can result in a number of different symptoms. And dysphagia is never a diagnosis on its own. It is always related to a separate underlying medical condition. So you can't just have a swallowing problem without being diagnosed with some other underlying condition. Some symptoms of dysphagia that maybe you are experiencing might include difficulty chewing, trouble keeping food or liquid inside your mouth. You might have something leak out the front of your mouth during or after swallowing. You might pocket food. That basically means you may have food collecting in your cheeks or outside of your teeth in between your teeth and your cheeks if you have a little bit of weakness in your face muscles, the food can collect there without um, using your, your fingers or your tongue to clear it out if there's weakness. Sometimes difficulty chewing and swallowing can result in extended meal times, which can be really frustrating and time consuming. You can get really fatigued while eating, Weight loss can be a concern, and, and this is a particular issue for people who have cerebral palsy. Malnutrition and weight loss can be an issue, and it could be related to some of these um, symptoms of difficulty swallowing. A lot of people might experience food or liquids feeling stuck in the throat or in the chest. You may have some feeling of regurgitation or reflux after meals. And then there's the symptoms of aspiration. So aspiration is food or liquid going down the wrong pipe. And the wrong pipe is your windpipe down to your lungs. Most of the time, people feel food and liquid when it goes down the wrong pipe. You might develop a wet, gurgly sounding voice after swallowing something down the wrong way. 
Sometimes it can cause coughing and choking. Sometimes you might clear your throat. If this is chronic and it happens all the time, or there are other neurological and sensory changes, you can get silent aspiration, and that is food or liquid going down the wrong way into your airway without it triggering a cough. When patients come to see us, we often um, will do a clinical swallowing evaluation. So if you're in the hospital or your physician has referred you for a swallowing evaluation, the first part of that might be just meeting with us in your room or in clinic to do a brief evaluation. We would, we would look through your chart, review all your symptoms of difficulty swallowing, then we're going to take a very close look at the structure and function of your lips, tongue, uh, your palate in the back of your throat to see the speed of movements, the strength of movements, and the coordination and range of motion of all of the muscles that you use to speak and swallow. That assessment also includes um, evaluating your cognitive status and your ability to communicate verbally. We look at your breathing. And then the clinical swallow evaluation includes trials of food and liquid. We often will use water, applesauce, pudding, fruit cocktail, or graham crackers. If you've been through one of these tests with us before, you've probably, um, this sounds familiar to you. When the clinical swallow evaluation doesn't give us all the information that we need, we will often recommend um, an instrumental swallow evaluation. And we have two different types of formal instrumental exams. The more common test is called a video swallow study, or might, might also be called a modified barium swallow, depending on where you are regionally. And the other type of test that we have is called a FEES, and that's a fiber optic or flexible endoscopic exam of the swallow. If you are referred for a video swallow study and you come to see us here at Michigan Medicine, this is what the room looks like. You can either sit in your own wheelchair or sit in our swallowing chair, and the x-ray camera comes down alongside of you and we take moving x-ray pictures while you swallow all of these trials of barium liquids and barium coated foods. So from left to right, we use a thin liquid barium, a thick liquid barium, pudding mixed with barium, fruit cocktail coated with barium liquid, and a Lorna June cookie coated with barium powder. Some people who have difficulty swallowing pills might also get a barium pill with water or however else you, you swallow pills, just for us to do extra assessment. Here is what that looks like. So we've got a side view of the head and neck during the swallow. And this is a, a normal swallow. This is what um, a swallow looks like with a sip of liquid. So if you can see where all of that black liquid is going, that's the esophagus right down the food tube. The esophagus is closed all of the time until you swallow something and then it opens up like a snake swallowing a rat, right? So it's closed, you swallow the liquid, the esophagus opens up and then it closes again. Most importantly, we don't see any black liquid left over in the throat, and we don't see any liquid leaking forward down into the windpipe. So this swallow looks good. This is an example of someone who has some aspiration. And there's a cough. So if you take a look towards the left side of the video, there it goes, a big drip of liquid spilling down into the upper airway. So this swallow is not as strong as the first swallow. You can see that there is some liquid left over in the throat after the patient swallows. And then again, that classic liquid leaking forward, um, touching the vocal cords and then dripping down into the lower part of the airway. This is our 
endoscopic swallow evaluation. And this is what the inside of your throat looks like. So we have a bird's eye view of the upper airway and the throat. And I'm showing this to you to show you how close the esophagus is to the airway. So the V shape in the direct middle of your screen are your vocal cords. And this is your voice box sitting on top of the airway. So your vocal cords are this V shape that's right on top of your windpipe. If you look straight above that to where all that blue liquid is pooled, that is the top of the esophagus. So it's completely closed until you swallow something. But you can see there's, there's virtually no distance between the opening of the back of the airway and the esophagus. And this swallow, I'm gonna play it again, shows a little bit of blue liquid leaking into the voice box during the swallow. So you can see after the swallow, there's a coating of blue that's leaking down and pooling right on top of the vocal cord. So this, this is a, a person who's having some difficulty closing their airway completely, and there's some weakness in the throat where they're not clearing all of the liquid through and it's pooling in the back pockets of the throat. I'm going to introduce the eating and drinking ability classification system now. Um, this is something that was developed in the UK and published in 2013 and is a classification of how people with cerebral palsy eat and drink in everyday life. It's not a test, but it's just a way to describe five different levels of ability of chewing and swallowing. And the main issue is determining the safety and efficiency of oral intake, eating and drinking. There are five different levels, ranging from level one being eats and drinks safely and efficiently, all the way down to level five, which is someone who is unable to eat or drink safely and probably needs tube feeding for their um, nutritional support. So let's go through these. This is for people who are three years old through to adulthood. There is also um, an eating and drinking classification system for children below three years old, but I did not include that today. So level one includes a person who's able to eat a wide variety of different types of textured foods that are age appropriate. Um, you're able to take several consecutive sips of liquids in a row. Every once in a while, you might cough or gag on a very challenging texture. All of the food stays in your mouth. There's nothing sticking in the mouth or leaking out of the for, uh, front of the mouth when you eat or drink. And you're able to clear the food from your teeth and dislodge food from your cheeks. So this is someone who is um, functioning very well. They maybe are just having very, very minor issue chewing and swallowing, but generally this is very safe and very efficient. Level two is where some limitations to efficiency crop up. So again, you're able to eat a wide variety of age appropriate foods, but the chewing might be a little bit slower. You may chew with your lips open. Um, you may be able to use a straw to drink. Again, it's not terribly uncommon to cough or gag when you're tired or eating something that's very challenging. You might cough more often if you're taking larger, fast sips of liquids. And there tends to be a little bit more fatigue and extended meal times with level two. Level three includes a few more diet consistency modifications. So this is someone who may have difficulty moving food and controlling it in their mouth such that the food may need to be pureed or very, very soft. Um, 
someone at this level might need their liquids to be thickened to help them go a little slower through the throat. You may only be able to eat or drink in certain situations with a certain caregiver or family member without any distractions at all. And um, this is uh, extended meal times occur with this level, and it's not uncommon to have food or liquid spilling out of the mouth um, while eating and drinking. Level four is starting to get towards the level where there may be more frequent episodes of choking, aspiration, very long meal times, significant diet modifications where you absolutely could only manage something pureed. Otherwise, it would be very risky. You may not be able to chew solid food at all or any soft solid food at this stage. Um, keeping food and liquid in the mouth is more of a challenge. And uh, if you are given something with any lumps or solid pieces, we often see um, swallowing whole without chewing or breaking down. So this is a higher risk for choking and aspiration when we see this level four and there, there needs to be high attention during mealtime to make sure that you're able to eat and drink safely. And then lastly, level five is um, someone who may not be able to eat or drink anything safely without um, very high risk for choking or aspiration or malnutrition or dehydration. So in general, someone at a level five is probably not eating by mouth and has a feeding tube for nutrition, 100% of their nutritional needs. I'm gonna go through some research updates. I hope that it's not too boring. Um, I tried to break it down into what I thought was going to be um, most salient for everybody. I will start by, by saying there is not a lot of research in swallowing issues with adults who have cerebral palsy. Um, it's, uh, there's a real lack of research. And so we just have a few studies to review here today. This is uh, actually a pediatric journal that was published in 2017, just overviewing people who have cerebral palsy and the difficulty swallowing. So in um, children with cerebral palsy, two out of three children will have difficulty swallowing. And this can impact nutritional status respiratory health and parental stress. There is a classification system of gross motor function used for people who have cerebral palsy. And again, it's a one through five rating system, just like the, the eating and swallowing rating system we just talked about. The GMFCS goes from one to five, five being most severely impacted, requiring um, uh, alternative seating device, wheelchair, may need uh, a communication device, and may have a feeding tube. So what this study showed is that as children aged into their third year, children with cerebral palsy show improvements in their feeding and swallowing. And I'm going to show you a chart here. If you take a look at um, no, it's not in color, but essentially this chart shows that a significant number of every level of ability, one through five, when kids are 18 to 24 months of age, there's a significant portion of kids who have difficulty swallowing. So even in the least impacted from a motor standpoint, an ambulatory child 60% of kids who are in that level one least impacted GMFCS start out having some difficulty swallowing. The great news is, is you can see this nice stepwise decline in the presence of swallowing disorders, where if you get over to 54 to 60 months, 
So this is a five-year-old, only 15% of kids in that level one GMFCS motor rating scale have difficulty swallowing. Level two goes from 78% down to 43%. Level three goes from 93% down to 67%. Where we don't see much change at all is in that level four and level five ratings where there's more um, severe impact from a motor coordination control aspect where the swallowing does not really improve at that level. This next study uh, I thought was very interesting and it was more um, an interview of people who have cerebral palsy on their symptoms of difficulty swallowing. And at the beginning of the study, these are adults now, um, many of the people did not have any difficulty swallowing at the beginning of the study, but experienced increase in symptoms as they aged. And I want to highlight this bubble on the right, the average age of the onset of when your swallow function can begin to deteriorate in adults with cerebral palsy starts around 33 years of age. So as children are born, their swallowing problems get better, better, better. And there's the leveling off kind of from age five to age 30 or 33. And then the swallowing problems can progress and get worse with time after the age of 33. And I, I'm going to read some of these quotes coming up, but the examiners in this study asked, tell me about your mealtimes and any changes you've experienced over the past two years. And they came up with these four main themes coming out of the interviews. But I, I really appreciated reading each of these quotes because I think it helps me understand more what I need to do as a clinician in coming up with a collaborative plan with my patients to make sure that what our recommendations are, are not too abrupt. And we explain why we may not recommend someone continue eating solid food. So I'm going to read these out loud because I think it, they might speak to each of you. So the first um, person said, I've got to concentrate more on my eating and swallowing. It goes down the wrong way or something. Another person said, I have to take more time because I can't hurry. People hurry me on. I feel the food in my mouth and then I'm choking. In the last couple of years, I can have a good day and then a bad day. I was okay today. Tomorrow I have the same meal and I'm coughing and choking my way through it. This person got a piece of meat stuck in their throat. They managed to get it down, but it was an effort. It was frightening. Thank heavens it went down without me having to go to the hospital. Um, often the food is too difficult to manage, so I sometimes just don't eat it. I've been very aware in recent times because my fingers, they just don't operate as well as they used to. And just to pick up the cutlery, it's a different ball game. And lastly, the greatest fear this person said was losing the ability to feed herself because when you can feed yourself, you can gauge how much you're putting on the spoon, how quickly you're feeding yourself. But when you're being fed by someone else, they gauge that for you. This study also um, found that a lot of people have reflux and gastrointestinal problems separate from the, the oropharyngeal, the difficulty swallowing in the mouth or the throat. What I found um, a little sobering is that a lot of the patients felt real strong anger and frustration when their diets were changed, meaning it, maybe they were on a regular diet at some point and then they, they maybe they had a choking episode or something happened and their, their diet changed to something softer. And there's a real sense of loss of control. And I think that's something that um, 
we need to, to be very cognizant of as speech pathologists, making sure that we are making the best recommendation from a quality of life and goals of care standard for our patients who are coming to see us for, for tips and strategies. Um, we don't always want to say, oh, well, now you have to blenderize all your food. So enjoy your hamburger all blended up. Um, that's not our goal, but we, we do want to work together to make sure that we're making the best recommendations for our patients. So um, in general, uh, mealtimes can be really stressful because they can take a lot of extra time and, and parents can be frustrated because difficulty chewing and swallowing is often a hallmark of, of difficulty with kids um, growing up who have cerebral palsy and mealtimes are just really stressful and unpleasant. What I thought was really interesting is of the people who use some kind of augmentative communication device, if the device was a lower tech sort of communication board, um, none of the six participants in this study had access to their communication boards during a meal. So they were not really able to share if they felt like they were being fed too fast or the bites were too big for them. They were just unable to communicate at that time. And that I assume has to be incredibly frustrating. Here's another study outlining people who have um, a subtype of dyskinetic cerebral palsy with a cervical dystonia. Um, essentially, people who have difficulty in dystonia in the head and neck region can have an outsized difficulty with their swallowing compared to other people who have different subtypes of cerebral palsy. So if you have a, a dystonia and difficulty coordinating your head and neck, the chances are you may have more difficulty with your swallow function than other people around your same age and function. Again, this article outlines uh, a slow, steady deterioration in swallow function with people over 30 years old. And dysphagia is a concern. Obviously, we want to prevent people from aspirating because the most common cause of death in this population is respiratory failure due to aspiration and pneumonia. So these um, patients who had the dystonic, dyskinetic cerebral palsy were evaluated um, using clinical swallow evaluations and video swallow studies. Their most um, prevalent findings were difficulty chewing, reduced tongue movement and control, followed by poor throat movement. So your larynx is your voice box. It needs to pull up and forward when you swallow. If your airway doesn't pull up and forward at the right time or completely, it makes it very easy for food and liquid to go down the wrong pipe into your airway. In this population, silent aspiration was observed in about 50% of the patients examined. So meaning food or liquid generally in this study, thin liquids like water, coffee, tea, soda, juice, that is the highest risk of being aspirator going down the wrong pipe. And 50% of these patients had silent aspiration. So liquid was going into their airway and they may not have been aware of that. In this study, they determined that swallow function might more be associated with the severity of the cervical dystonia rather than the otherwise the gross motor function. And their recommendation is to get screened for swallowing issues to avoid any future complications. This is a, an article um, by a physiatrist, and this was published in 2019, so a rehab doctor. 
um, shared that the population of adults with cerebral palsy is it's increasing. We have a lot of medical advances. And so we have adults who are living longer and um, there are about a million adults with cerebral palsy in the US currently. This is based in 2019. So I, I have to assume that that number is a little bit higher. Maybe you guys have an updated number for me. But the hospitalization rate was ninefold higher for people with cerebral palsy versus other age matched adults. Um, this is important because we often see a bit of a decline in swallow function when people are in the hospital sick with another type of an illness. It doesn't matter what it is. If you're in with a, a urinary tract infection or pneumonia, your swallowing function could be a bit worse in the setting of a, an acute illness. And again, um, we've seen this in the past couple of studies, adults may experience a gradual deterioration in your swallowing and mealtime capabilities. When patients have had video swallow studies, we often see that silent aspiration, meaning there's something going on with the sensory aspect of the swallow that is impacting your ability to protect your airway. Quickly, we'll run through this. Um, this study talks about the different types of swallowing symptoms that are most common in people who have cerebral palsy. So, uh, choking on food, choking on liquid, coughing when food becomes stuck in the throat, coughing, clearing the throat when something goes down the wrong way, feeling like food is sticking in the throat and gagging. A lot of people report thick saliva or excess saliva. And then from a, the mouth perspective, a lot of people have chewing problems, food sticking in and around the mouth food spilling, dribbling from the mouth, drooling, or food or liquid coming out through the nose. And the what's really surprising, or maybe not so, is there's a, a statistically significant difference in your, your BMI, so your weight, a reflection of your nutrition status, according to how long it takes you to get through a meal. So if your meal times are quite extended, it's taking you more than half an hour or, or taking even as long as an hour to eat, generally those patients are thinner and have a lower BMI. Um, there are plenty of people who, who may be on a regular full oral diet without any restrictions, but they still have a lot of signs and symptoms of difficulty chewing and swallowing. We know in adults that swallowing symptoms can be problematic and frequent and troublesome and can have a really profound effect on your quality of life. And the recommendation is that um, adults with cerebral palsy should be offered a swallowing evaluation to determine if any modif modifications might be beneficial. So. This is a swallow study of one of my patients, and she graciously allowed me to share it. And this is a clear example of her not chewing at all. Her mouth is moving up and down, her jaws are moving up and down, but this is a piece of fruit and it's just here in the middle of her tongue and the whole piece of fruit slides down the back of her throat completely unchewed. And so her family thought she was chewing pretty well until we got these x-ray pictures that showed she wasn't really, she's just moving her jaw, not breaking down the food at all um, to swallow it safely. So there is good news. Um, there is some therapy that can be beneficial to improve the swallowing. We do have some exercises that can help improve the strength and coordination of your chewing and swallowing muscles. There is a uh, large body of research now on expiratory muscle strength training, and we have devices that you blow through that provide a little bit of extra resistance that can improve uh, the, the strength 
of swallow. It can reduce the amount of food sticking in your throat and it can improve your cough strength to help clear aspiration out of the airway. And there are also biofeedback and some electrical stimulation modules that can be helpful in um, swallowing rehab therapy. Lastly, we offer some diet modifications and safe swallowing strategies to help people have less events where they are coughing and choking and getting food or liquid into the airway. In general, um, some patients might benefit from soft, cohesive foods that have a pretty small bite size. So the size of the adult trachea is 1.5 centimeters square. And so we recommend that foods, or it's, it's a bit bigger than 1.5 centimeters, but we recommend that foods are chopped into pieces smaller than 1.5 centimeters square for adults and eight millimeters by eight millimeters for children. Um, because if it does accidentally go into the airway, it won't fully obstruct the airway. At Michigan Medicine and internationally, we use something called IDSI, which is International Dysphagia Diet Standardization Initiative. If you need texture modified food, I highly recommend taking a look at their website at idsi.org. They have specific guides for all different levels of pureed foods, soft and bite-sized foods, minced foods, foods that are easy to chew, and it it provides you a detailed description of what each of these levels are. So puree diet is just what it looks like. Everything is completely blended. It holds its shape and it falls off the spoon in a single spoonful when it's tilted. These foods shouldn't be too sticky or dry. The next level up for someone who's able to chew and has better control of food in the mouth might be level five, minced and moist. So as the picture shows, a um, little bit of guacamole and soft cooked vegetables on top of some soft rice. Everything sticks together. It's nice and easy to chew and swallow if you have some weakness or difficulty coordinating food and liquid in the mouth. Level six, soft and bite size. This is like what I call our macaroni and cheese and banana diet. So here in the hospital, if you're on the level six, soft and bite size diet, you can have things like scrambled eggs, a banana, macaroni and cheese, other soft pastas that require a little bit of chewing, but they're still soft and cohesive and stick together pretty easily. It's not going to break apart and spread all over your mouth or fall back into your throat before you're ready for it. And then there's a, a subset of a regular diet that includes an easy to chew diet. So this is for someone maybe who doesn't have good teeth, who doesn't um, have the strength and endurance to get through a full meal with regular consistency foods. This includes things like um, fish and omelets and other foods that are nice and soft and easy to chew. Um, and uh, bread is, sometimes included if you don't have difficulty with choking or, or bread getting stuck in the throat. Bread and meat are the, the two highest choking risk foods. Um, and that has been studied uh, through autopsy results. And so if you have any difficulty with your chewing or the control of food and liquid in your mouth, you may wanna consider avoiding bread and solid pieces of meat. Some people benefit from thickening their liquids. Not everybody does. It's not a blanket uh, recommendation that we make. We, we try to be um, really cognizant whenever we're recommending thick liquids for someone because they are generally not, um, you may just not like them as much and you might not drink enough and then you're gonna get dehydrated. And then we're worrying about the side effects of dehydration versus aspiration. But um, thicker liquids generally travel slower through the mouth and the throat. So if your swallow reflex is a little bit too slow, a thicker liquid may be easier for you to swallow, might stay out of your airway and prevent you from coughing or choking. So my final thoughts, 
for you before I, I open up to any questions are that your swallow function and the safety and the efficiency of your eating can start to deteriorate with age. And as we saw, 33 seems to be the, the beginning of what can be some challenges that crop up with your chewing and swallowing. Many people who have cerebral palsy may silently aspirate, especially thin liquids. Um, and this can be a concern if you have repeated pneumonias and you're not quite sure where the pneumonia is coming from, you don't feel like you're coughing or choking, it might be a good idea to get evaluated um, using a video swallow study. But in general, if you feel like you're struggling at all with your chewing or your swallowing, or you have some of those symptoms of food leaking out of your mouth or difficulty chewing or feeling like things are getting stuck, it might be a good idea to just uh, get a referral and see someone like myself, a speech pathologist who could help you with any safe swallowing strategies or diet modifications. In general, taking a smaller sip and a smaller bite and eating slower will help your body control the food and liquid so that it is safer and easier to swallow. And working on softer, more cohesive foods may prevent some of those more complicated textured foods from falling into the back of your throat and giving you a lot of symptoms of trouble. So I would love to answer any questions you may have, because um, I think we have a little bit of time left. Yes, we do have a lot of time, about 10, 15 minutes left. Does anyone have any questions or more? Put them in the chat room or might be able to unmute you. Yeah, I know. Um, oh, there is one. Okay. Oh, everyone should be able to. Check it on you. Oh, yeah. So Sharon says she has trouble with lettuce. So lettuce is something that we we call a floppy food. So if you think about lettuce, it's just, it's floppy and it sticks to the side of your throat. And lettuce often comes as a salad. And a salad is often full of a bunch of different textured foods that you're eating all at the same time. And that can be really complicated. But lettuce is not included on any of those softer diets outlined by IDSI because it is floppy and it sticks to the side of your throat and it can... Um, just be very difficult to break down. So even if you feel like you're chewing it up, it doesn't always um, turn into a nice, easy bite of food to swallow. So some people will do a little bit better if the lettuce is chopped up pretty finely, almost like you eat a, a coleslaw mixed with the coleslaw dressing. If you chop the floppy lettuce up into small, small, small pieces, it's not blended, but chopped into smaller pieces, it should be less likely to get stuck. But no restaurant is going to serve you 
a tiny chopped up piece of lettuce. It's going to come as a big old floppy piece of lettuce that is more challenging to eat. So salad is a good thing to avoid if you are out at a restaurant and you know you have to focus and concentrate. Uh, save that for home when you know you can control the size of the bite and, and maybe give it a rough chop. Um, romaine lettuce might be a little easier than something like spinach that, that is big and floppy. You just may have to play around with the diff different types of greens to see if there's something that feels a little easier going down. You know, nuts and popcorn and seeds and crackers, all those dry, crumbly things, pineapple, those are all included in the list of, of really, really challenging things to chew and swallow. Um, again, bread and meat, solid pieces of meat like steak and pork chop or a baked chicken, that's very different than something that's been slow cooked say in a crock pot like shredded pork or shredded beef or shredded chicken. Um, it, if you cover it with a little bit of sauce, it sticks together and it's not like swallowing a cube of meat. So as Sharon likes to swallow her pills with pop, me too. I have a little bit of trouble swallowing pills. Yeah. And I mm -hmm. Stumbled across it one day. I drink these, uh, Spin Drift or LaCroix. I like the seltzer water. And I don't know, I took a Tylenol one day with the bubbly water and it just it like slid right down like a cloud. And I thought, oh my gosh, mm -hmm. <laughs> my patients would really um, appreciate knowing this. So if you have trouble swallowing pills and you can swallow thin liquids well, then try to swallow it with a little something carbonated and see if it'll float down. The other trick, and it's not much of a trick, I think it's pretty widely known, is to try and take your pills with applesauce or pudding. A lot of times just not having to swallow the pill and liquid all at the same time can be easier to help it slide down. And this is, uh, this is for anyone who swallows pills. Pills are it's an abnormal thing to try to swallow. A lot of people will gag on pills because it's a foreign body going down whole that you don't chew up and your brain doesn't quite know what to do with it, especially if it's a really big pill. And once you have trouble swallowing a pill one time, uh, your brain says, oh no, not again with the pill. Uh, this is scary. You tense up and it becomes more difficult to get the pills down. You can also talk to your pharmacist, though, because some medications might come in liquid form and other medications can be split or crushed, and that might make it a little bit easier to get the food down or the pills. There's something in the chat. Yeah, chopped salad. Um, a chopped salad might be a good idea. I would just pay close and careful attention to what else is in the salad. So often a restaurant salad, if it's a chopped salad, has, you know, bacon and cheese and vegetables. And there are a lot of different textures all in one bite. This is similar to something like chicken stir fry, where you've got rice, which is one size and texture, uh, vegetables, which are a whole different size and texture, and then maybe a meat or a tofu, which is the third different kind of size and texture. So once you have five different sizes of chopped up foods and textures in your mouth, that can be more challenging just to control, to chew and swallow. You may need to keep <clears throat> things a little bit separate. So you, you make sure that you're not getting four or five or six different textures of food all in one bite. But chopping up the lettuce into little bite-sized diced squares will probably help that whole process of getting the floppy lettuce down. I didn't know we were going to talk so much about floppy lettuce. This is good. <laughs> Well, let's switch up and talk about 
like a candy ball. I mean, the chocolate will uh, melt in your mouth, but more by the nice, the caramel, mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. So a chocolate bar, let's talk about a Snickers. How many different textures are in the Snickers? You've got the, the chocolate coating that melts as soon as it gets in your mouth. And when it melts, the chocolate spills down the back of your tongue while you're mm -hmm. chewing the peanuts and the caramel and that whatever that nougat is, right? So you've got a slippery melting chocolate, a crunchy peanut, the sticky caramel, and that fluffy whatever that stuff is. You're trying to chew and break down the solid peanut while you're getting the caramel all over and the chocolate is melting and spilling down the back of your throat. I choke on chocolate. So anyone who has a little bit more difficulty controlling their tongue or difficulty chewing and moving food around their mouth is going to really struggle with something like a candy bar. It would be better to pick just a plain chocolate bar that has just one texture in it, or if you can think of any other chocolate bars that don't have four or five different textured ingredients in it, that would probably be helpful. I bet a Kit Kat would be much easier to, to tolerate and chew than a Snickers bar, just because it has fewer ingredients, fewer different textures to manage all at one time. What do you think about Snickers Blizzard from Dairy Queen? I love that. I think it's probably delicious. The thing with a blizzard is that then you are adding in another texture, which is ice cream. Yeah. And ice cream melts into a liquid the second it warms up in your mouth. Okay. And so then you've got the melting liquid right. ice cream potentially spilling into your throat while you're trying to chew up the Snickers pieces in the blizzard. So that okay. it could be tricky um, depending on how fast you can swallow the ice cream. If it doesn't stick yeah. in your mouth for a long period of time and you can kind of eat the ice cream separately from the Snickers pieces, that would probably be a better way to get the blizzard down. Okay, I was just <laughs> trying to find a middle road if you can have a Snickers that maybe. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that if you love Snickers, you'll find a way to get it down. Um, the smaller bite you take, the easier it'll be to control it in your mouth so you don't have stuff falling down the back of your throat before you're ready for it. So it sounds like Sharon has trouble with chocolate candy and wake up at night and and you're choking. So Sharon, maybe are you, you feel like you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're choking on your spit. Sometimes when you wake up in the middle of the night and you feel like you're choking, it could be from reflux. So um, when you're laying down, depending on what position you're in when you sleep, if you sleep flat on your back, there is a chance that your, your last meal is still lingering in there and some stomach acid can come up into your throat in the middle of the night and you might wake up kind of gasping and having difficulty breathing. So it could be reflux. Um, your swallow slows down markedly when you're sleeping because you can't just be producing the same amount of saliva that you do during the day while you're asleep, you would drown. So it could just be that you, you know, you've got a little bit of excess saliva or some reflux that's contributing to this kind of coughing and choking when you're sleeping. You could try and sleep with your head elevated a little bit and see if that reduces your episodes of, of choking on your spit in the middle of the night. 
So sleeping on your left side is better for reducing reflux because your stomach is on the left. And when you sleep on the left, it gravity tends to keep the food and liquid and stomach acid on the, you know, the left side of your body. So it's less likely to sneak up the food tube and get up into your throat. So the left side is a good side to sleep on to reduce your risk of reflux. I wish I could help. That's that's a little bit tricky. The saliva choking you at night is it can be a challenge. Well, thank you so for your time and your and dollars. I really appreciate you taking this time and educating us. I was very happy to take the time to do it, and I'm I'm so thankful for the invitation. Uh, if anyone has any additional questions that they didn't feel comfortable sharing, I've included my email here. And if you're interested in coming to see me uh, for an evaluation, I'd be happy to see you. This is the number to our our clinic. Um, you would need a doctor to to write a referral to come and see us for a swallow study, but you can always call. Uh, 734-763-4003 um, and talk to our scheduling staff if you have any questions. Thank you. All right. Bye, everybody. Please, Thank you. Please join me on August 25th. We're going to talk about coping skills with cerebral palsy. Uh, we're going to be that job. And I Oh, hope I'm saying it right. Well done. Well done. Elaine. From U of M. So it should be good. Have a good weekend. Thank you, Sarah.